Major support for these broadcasts is provided by Bank of America Merrill Lynch and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, m and Bank. Additional support is provided by AVR Realty Company, LLC, All Nation Renovation, Ackman Ziff Real Estate Group, Bingham McCutcheon, LLP, Briarwood Organization, Capital One Bank, Cassidy Turley, C.B. Richard Ellis, Chelsea Lighting, Inc., Cushman and Wakefield, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, DDG Partners, Eastern Consolidated, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Friedman, LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Genova, Burns and Gian Tomasi, Goldman Properties, Investors Savings Bank, Jack Jaffa and Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, James Orfanides Centurion Holdings, Corman Communities, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, Margolin Weiner and Evans LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Must Development, Newmark Knight Frank, RAL Development Services, The Spandrel Group, LLC, Site Comply, Sterling & Sterling, Stonehenge Partners, Triangle Equities, The Wickoff Group, Urban American. So there is this group of individuals, they're called private equity, and they are the players. They're the guys who are buying all the real estate in the country. So I've assembled the four of them, four of these prominent people to tell us what they like, what they don't like, where they're buying, and what they expect to see in 2012. My guests today include Stephen Wolf, who is a partner at Aria Property Partners, Russell Appel, who is the founding principal and president of the Paradian Group. Michael Boxer, who's the founding principal and managing partner, RCG Ramius, uh, RCG Longview. And last but not least, a returnee, Jeff Kaplan, who's the founding partner and managing partner at Meadow Partners. So, you know, you were an international player. You were buying all over the world. Now you buy in New York City and London? I mean, that's a little interesting Phenomenon. What's the, the correlation between London and New York City? I thought London was expensive. Well, um, they're both highly liquid uh, gateway cities. And that's really what we, I guess, starting in 2003, we really tried to scale back what was a global footprint in, I don't know, 30 states and 11 countries. We looked back at sort of what worked and what didn't work. And one of the big takeaways was when we went to tertiary and even secondary cities by investment liquidity, we tended not to get paid for the risk. So London and New York are on most international investors' radar screens. Um, there are also markets that tended to have higher leverage, more complicated financial structures, and therefore more distressed today, which is really what we're focused on. Now, the interesting thing, Steve, is you had a large amount of properties in New York, and over the years, you have very successfully sold 1290 out of the Americas, some other properties, but you really haven't acquired recently in New York. Why not? Well, we've grown to be a global fund manager with $13 billion in equity and over $65 billion of committed transactions. So when you take your footprint and you go global, obviously, you're investing elsewhere. In New York, we continue to look in New York, and it's obviously gotten very pricey recently. So we've gone to other cities in the States. Russell, where, I mean, you last year, I mean, over the last two years, you've really invested close to a billion dollars around the country, mm -hmm. but also in the local footprint. Well, you know, a little bit for us, there's a, a trade-off, Jeff, between sort of liquidity and growth versus yield. Um, in New York, you've got to buy at lower yields, but you're betting on growth and liquidity. And so, quite frankly, since 2008, we've been looking at 
risk a little differently. And where we can have more yield, we think there's a little less risk. So while I understand the focus, I understand the growth aspect, and certainly the 03 to 07 period, there was a lot of growth. But when we look at the current market, and we do do deals in New York, by the way, but we also do deals outside New York. But usually what we're doing in terms of balancing a portfolio, our New York assets tend to look for a little more growth, a little more liquidity, but often we're giving up yield. If we can buy a 14% cash on cash yield in a you know, non-gateway market, and we can put good financing on that, you know, we've mitigated our risk to a certain extent. We'll prob we may have less upside growth in the residual, but we're making a great current yield along the way. Now, Michael, what, what, over the last couple of years, I mean, going back in 2001, 2002, the last, I mean, you were very active in Enron's uh, office building. You had some other properties, and, you know, you've invested in 200 West 57th Street and a variety of others. Where where have you where are you active in the last two years or, or let's say in, during 2011 where have you where have you seen your investments? Well, post Lehman collapse in 2008, the vast majority of our investment activities have been in the debt space. Uh, we think that that proposes <coughs> proposes the correct sort of risk reward proposition, if you will, uh, for the equity guys. Uh, not unlike the people sitting around uh, here today, uh, they're targeting returns either in the high teens or even you know 20 and low 20s for those equity deals to work out the way they would like to expect. They need one, two, three, four, five uh, factors to all fall into place. And if each one of those factors fall into place, they hit their targeted returns. We're putting debt out to yield to ourselves and our investors 12, 13, 14 percent, which we think poses the right risk reward proposition because you have the equity buffer to protect you if things go wrong. So 12, 13, 14 percent with a 15 or 20 percent equity buffer or own the equity for a targeted 15, 16, 17 percent return, the debt space is where we want to be. Yeah, now the interesting situation is that you did put out debt in Harlem. And now you are, are basically loaning, you own the properties, right? What happened up in the Harlem on the Apex and the, the hotel and the other property on 125th Street? Right, you're talking about two separate properties. Right. I, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the Aloft Hotel on 124th Street and Frederick Douglass Boulevard was always done in our equity fund. Uh, we, had, uh, we were part of a partnership whereby the operating partner didn't really follow through on all of the things that they said they were going to do. So with our internal property management your construction your capability, we were no able question. to step in and take over the business plan. We executed on the construction ground up. We have a, uh, uh, by all accounts, a successful hotel up and running today. Occupancy ADRs are looking pretty good. We have 44 apartments above. We're in the middle of the sales process there. And surprisingly, uh, sort of, Good sales. I think there. you're over 45% sold. That's correct. In some of the statistics. Um, on 125th Street, uh, around the corner and a little bit further east, uh, we had made a land loan to a developer who was going to build uh, a hotel, a, a hotel extravaganza, and uh, their their plans had fallen through. What with the downturn, we took over the property uh, as a deed in lieu, and we are in the process of finalizing our development plans. It's going to have a, a, a very good uh, and attractive retail, retail component. And we're talking to a number of national retailers uh, right now to take over that space. Now, Jeff, you you've been in the you've been looking to buy debt, right, uh, over the last couple of years. I mean, that's most of what you've been doing. It's part of what we've been doing. We're really doing two things. I think the the first and foremost is recapitalizations and restructuring. So. Uh, for example, a borrower who's got an opportunity to pay down his debt at a discount or to take a lender out, um, and we're putting up the equity typically behind an existing borrower in a you know in a fixed position, if you will, um, to recap a, a fundamentally sound property that's stuck in a distressed capital stack or ownership situation. And then we've also along the way just done an outright uh, in three instances now outright purchases of distressed debt, non-performing loan on a loan-to-own basis, which we've gone ahead and, and foreclosed on. That's the one in Queens. That the one in Queens is the most recent example, um, was a built as a condo, 90% um, complete. 
Um, we bought it from a major money center bank that was at least about a year into the foreclosure. Um, and we're in the process of, uh, you know, negotiating with the borrower to, to take the keys back. Steve, I know, I think you've done that in Florida, right? In certain states around the country, you've bought some debt. Oh, absolutely. Uh, on the residential side, we were one of the first groups to step in, specifically in Miami, and buy debt uh, from a well-known lender on a failed condo. But our strategy wasn't to step in and to sell condos, but to go residential and rental. And um, in one specific case in Miami, uh, it's just amazing the rental growth we've seen from that transition once we've taken over the real estate, turned it, stepped in, finished the construction, and went rental. We, uh, on that particular project, were 50% ahead of time. More importantly, 15% ahead of where we thought rental growth would be. And so it's been effective for us. Um, that's primarily our debt purchases have been on the residential side. Russ? Yeah, I was going to say it's, a, it's clearly a big part of uh, our acquisition strategy right now. I mean, everyone talks about off-market deals, and really the way to buy off-market deals today is either, as Jeff mentioned, to buy the debt, usually because the sellers are, you know, you're not buying the asset directly. There's kind of a few steps you have to go through, and quite frankly, you may never get the collateral. I mean, a real good workout investor is going to look at alternative strategies besides owning the real estate, restructuring, maybe getting a payoff from the borrower, et cetera, but having a flexible mindset uh, going in. But again, there's a real investment thesis usually with those deals or recapitalizations, which is another significant part of, uh, of our investment strategy. And obviously, when a borrower works with the bank or with some other third party partner to buy them out, that again is an off market transaction. And so you don't have sort of that competitive bidding frenzy. I mean, here's a question. Do you see, you know, there was this discussion, you know, we were talking about the DOA Piper event, and there was a discussion saying now that the Anglo Irish deal took place and Bank of America sold some their paper, you'll see more banks selling more debt over the next uh, 2012. Do you agree with that? Well, in size, I think it's been happening in smaller amounts, as Russ just mentioned. And I think a lot of our borrowers and our relationships out there have obviously, over the last few years, been working with their lenders. So I think it will open up, our opinion, a, a little bit, possibly, the floodgates. You still have a lot of debt coming due over the next couple of years. Those numbers that we all know about have been pushed out. I, I think, but the big situation is, I mean, the reason that real estate is still working well is because of the low interest rates, the current interest rate environment. I mean, if we were at the time when it was seven, six, seven, eight percent, number of these properties wouldn't meet the numbers. You couldn't be able to. Most of the properties. That's correct. Most of the properties would not be able to. If you look at hotel loans and you look at, look at a lot of hotel loans were done, should have been done, they're done on floating rate, uh, obviously. Uh, most borrowers of hotels ebb and flow with the economy and stick with floating rate. Today, they're paying 1%, in some cases 1.5%, and they're, they're alive. Now, both of you made a heavy investment over the last year in Texas. Why do you like Texas so much? Russ? Job creation. You know, it's a place where there's job creation. There's growth. Um, and there's job creation. But in the same manner, I agree there's job creation. Isn't there the, the the situation in Texas, they can build. There's no problem getting a permit and building another property right next door. Yeah, but you know what? If you can buy at significant discounts to construction cost, I mean, the real impediment today isn't the dirt. It isn't the entitlements in some of these markets. It's the economics. So if you can buy at a substantial discount to construction cost or replacement cost, you've got a competitive edge over the next guy if you have similar product. And so if you can buy on that basis, it makes sense. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And you are beginning to see the developers step back into these markets, recognizing the rental growth we've had. We've bought close to 6,000 apartments in Texas between really high growth markets, Dallas, Austin's a very strong market, San Antonio, Houston. We've seen 10% increases. Russ and I were talking before the show consistently among our portfolio. And so naturally you're seeing developers step in and beginning to look at those rental rates and seeing that they can build. I don't see that product coming online for a few years, so the timing of how we sell these will become important. Uh, we, we certainly have a couple of years of real real growth in these markets. Now, you used to be, you have a, how many 
residential rental do you own about twenty thousand in total around about that so what do you how do you look at the, the the local residential market how do you look at it today well uh new york continues to be a supply constrained market uh Nowhere in the world you have the economic drivers that you see in New York City from healthcare to uh, the arts to finance to education, tourism. Um, we just continue to believe that the, the economic drivers in a place like New York is, uh, is unlike anywhere so else have, in the have world. You, have you purchased new apartments new not new apartments have you have you bought anything in the new york city market over the last year no we haven't bought any apartments in the new york city market but we have lent against it for the same reasons that i described earlier now we've we've bought about a little over a thousand units in new york city in the last 18 months and the rental growth is just incredible you know we're we're finding deals where literally rents are moving 10% from what we underwrote in our due diligence period, you know, in a 30 or 60 day. Now, how many period. of those deals that you acquired were acquired like from loans or how many were direct acquisitions? Uh, most of them were direct, uh, about 200, uh, a little bit more, call it 250 out of 1,200 units were through I, loans I, and the rest were equity deals. I did a show about two weeks ago where I had uh, four investment professionals and they were saying to me, I had somebody who does a lot of properties in Brooklyn, Aaron Young Rice, and Peter Hopsburg, that rentals, the same way that because of the, the pent up demand and the fact that people are renting, are now selling at seven, eight times numbers. I mean, when do you say it's too much? When do you, I mean, everything is fine, but you know, when 2008 happened, and let's remember Lehman, and people then lost their jobs. And people said, some of them moved back to mommy. Some of them said, instead of having their own apartment, they moved three people into one apartment. So there was slowness in the Bronx. I mean, I mean, Phil Eisenberg has said that to me. But as, as, Rush, as Russ mentioned, uh, the yields that you're able to achieve by buying multifamily in New York are lower than elsewhere. And there's a reason for that. And that's the depth of the marketplace. If you take a look at uh, the recovery cycles uh, uh, across markets, you will see that the New York market and maybe a market or two elsewhere in the country uh, is the first to recover. Uh, it recovers uh, most extensively and most deeply, and that's the reason why people are willing to go deeper down into the capital stack, pay higher gross rent multiples and lower cap rates in order for, in order for them to have that resiliency. You know, people watch this from around the world and other places. It's not only New York City. I mean, I know Russell has made investments preferred equity in Union, New Jersey. You've bought apartments in New Jersey and Newark. You've bought a property over there. Where do you see the other parts of the area? How do you see New Jersey? How do you look at New Jersey, Westchester, uh, Connecticut in today's environment? as investors. Jeff, you're right now you're only in New York City and that's what all you're looking at. We right? we no, we're we're able to do greater New York. Um, we've only done New York City on the commercial side, only Manhattan. We've done the one um, rental apartment deal in in Queens and a busted condo deal in Staten Island. I think it depends on the property type. Um, you know, the last thing in the world we would touch is suburban office, but pretty much anywhere, let alone, you know, suburban. Russell, you you own some suburban office? We do. <laughs> we do. Suburban office is very tough right now. We haven't really acquired I didn't much say you suburban bought office recently. In, in recent, no. But that's right. I think, I think, as Jeff said, I think suburban office is, uh, is a tough market today. I mean, unless you really have the best quality properties. I mean, Stephen has done very well because their suburban or even downtown office has been sold. I mean, the properties in Boston, the properties in Washington, right. even the Georgia properties. As, as luckily have a number of the deals that, uh, that we've done. But um, I think the real tough thing about investing today is in a low demand growth environment, how do you make good money? How do you make attractive returns in a low demand growth environment? We have found certain situations, a lot of them, you know, on, in, in multifamily where there is better demand growth, right? There is right. demand like growth there. About in Texas, no. We would argue that outside of multifamily, there are few places with strong demand growth. So then for us, 
you either have to find assets that you can buy cheap, either through, in our case, either through recapitalizations or through the distressed debt where you can find things that are more attractively priced, or you have to go in with a very specific plan to increase the cash flows of an asset, where you have a plan where you feel comfortable that independent of the market, or generally independent of the market, that you have a plan to enhance the cash flows of that property. I'd like to, to, to change the subject a little bit because I think it's interesting because people who call me, who watch, who email me, really would like to know how they get to, to do a deal with you and how could they, you know, th this is a big question normally on my seminars. People want to know how did they get to do business with Michael Boxer or Steve Wolf or Russ Appel? I mean, who can, what are you looking for? What type of bar investor? You know, somebody is coming to you. I, I remember I brought somebody to you a couple of months ago, the, the young guys from Texas. I mean, how, how, do you, what, how do you make a determination of who is the next guy that you're going to give them 90% or 95%? <clears throat> Steve? Sure. Well, for, for us, um, it's all about relationships. You know, my partners and I, we, we, the firm has been around since 1993. At uh, 26 years in the business, I'm, you know, Bill Mack is still 15 years more and maybe 20 years more, and Lee 10 years. Uh, and and uh, so certainly you get a lot of repeat business. We have. But how about a new person? That's what I'm talking about. Well, I'm, I'm going to tell you. So if you look at where we spent our, our money recently, we've bought 15,000 apartments and over 8 million square feet of industrial. And on the industrial, five million square feet of that was off-market transactions, where we sat down with groups that were looking to recap existing equity partners. And um, it, it's it's as simple as picking up a telephone, but it's as 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 deep as the relationships I just talked about. You've been doing it for 26 years. When you've put out 13 billion dollars of equity and 65 billion dollars of transactions, you you have your footprint, and you have the relationship. Russell. Yeah, I would say we have a slightly different view because uh, for us, first of all, people have to be honest, decent people. And that's something we do. We do a background check on new partners. Um, but I think for us, we are very into the business plan for a specific asset and what is required to execute the plan and what are the risks if we have the partner that doesn't have those capabilities and those right. skills to if they execute don't have, that Besides the plan. skills and the cash backup in case there's a problem later on for the, the development. You know, if they don't have the deep pockets or any pocket. Well, I was going to say, they have to have a certain level of deep pockets, but clearly part of why you're, they you're the us deep is pocket, the deep pocket. But we definitely want people that can show the skills to execute the plan and that have the experience that if the market changes, that they can help adapt to those changes, right? If the market changes, you can't always blame the partner if they're still doing as well as the market. But going in, if it's a deal that has to get leased up, you want someone that has strong leasing capabilities. In certain markets, there are certain tenants that are very strong in a market. You may want somebody that has a relationship with that tenant. Um, in certain markets, there's more of a renovation or a stylistic thing, you want someone that could complete those renovations and is good at that. A bunch of the deals that we've been involved with recently, there's a, a significant construction, rehab, Right, but we were talking about the AV, which okay. had a very... Fancy. Something like that. You want somebody that has those capabilities. So what we will we'll look at is what is the business plan for that investment? And do we have a partner that can <coughs> execute well in that plan? And if the market changes, do they have enough resources, experience, et cetera? Now, they have to have enough resources. And you went saw in 08, 09, a bunch of real estate operator developers didn't make it through. And <laughs> I, if, think, I think Michael just alluded to if, that uh, basically they, in those two deals if, in Harlem. And, and I think most of us, one of the lessons learned of the kind of 08, 09 period is to focus on you know, who you're doing business with. And, and, and do, that, do they have the those, comments that I made about Michael's that, investment, that yeah. they weren't bad investments, but you know what? The world changed, and that was really the circumstance. Yeah. Everybody wanted to do hotels in Harlem. When I was with Apollo, we liked the property on 125th Street. It was just we felt that the borrower who we had met was a tough guy. Listen, right. you make a loan, you, you make it to own it if you have to own it. There's no, it's, a, it's just like you said before, it's cheaper than essentially 
than doing it in equity the first time. Right, but that's not our business plan. Uh, we, we make a loan with the expectation that we're going to earn an acceptable rate of return and then get paid back. My take on uh, who do we do business with is slightly different, slightly different than Stevens and Russ's. That's why you're here. <laughs> I try to take a step back and I try to imagine what it would be like to deal with this person when things go sideways. Everybody gets along swimmingly when things are going great, but when you hit a bump in the road and the unexpected rears its head, is this somebody I am going to be able to sit down with, look them in the eye, and despite what all the documents say and all the protections built into the structure, is this somebody who I am going to be able to reach a reasonable conclusion with? So who am I getting into bed with? Operational expertise, definitely a high second on the list, and third, alignment of interests, i.e., how much cash are they bringing to the table? Jeff. We do one thing that I think is a little bit different than, than everybody else here in the sense that we do deals both directly ourselves and also with operating partners. Um, you know, in terms of looking at operating, we'll, we'll look at anything. Um, who's qualified? It's everything that's already been said. Um, I've found over time that the vast majority of deals we're doing are with relationships. It's hard to kind of break in the door. Um, not because we're not looking, we'll look at anything. We'll return calls, we'll look at emails, it's easy to do. It just seems that the quality, the better quality deal flow comes from people we know. And that includes, you know, you introducing us to somebody or, you know, maybe somebody we didn't know, but through, you know, somebody that we do. Okay, so, you know, 30 minutes is a difficult time to get everything, but I think we really got a lot covered today. And I think bringing out the, the final points to discuss how you look at a deal was really helpful. I'd like to thank Steve Wolf, Russell Appel, Michael Boxer, and last but not least, Jeff Kaplan. See you next week. Major support for these broadcasts is provided by Bank of America Merrill Lynch and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, M&T Bank. Additional support is provided by AVR Realty Company, LLC, All Nation Renovation, Ackman Ziff Real Estate Group, Bingham McCutcheon, LLP, Briarwood Organization, Capital One Bank, Cassidy Turley, C.B. Richard Ellis, Chelsea Lighting, Inc., Cushman and Wakefield, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, DDG Partners, Eastern Consolidated, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Friedman, LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Genova, Burns and Gian Tomasi, Goldman Properties, Investors Savings Bank, Jack Jaffa and Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, James Orfanides Centurion Holdings, Corman Communities, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, Margolin Weiner and Evans LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Must Development, Newmark Knight Frank, RAL Development Services, The Spandrel Group, LLC, Site Comply, Sterling & Sterling, Stonehenge Partners, Triangle Equities, The Wickhoff Group, Urban American.